So I think let's start. Everyone can hear me. Assalamu alaikum. Mansoor awaz aare. So we have two papers here. Uh, one is by Mr. Shahid Mahmood on the economic consequences of pandemics. And the other is by three authors, Dr. Naseem Faraz, Dr. Mahmood Khalid, and Dr. Muhammad Nasser, measuring the VAT gap in Pakistan, a top-down analysis. So let's begin with the pandemics by Mr. Shahid Mahmood. Hey, sir, it's over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Idris. Uh, 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 Mansoor, can you then run over the presentation? Yes, thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody, to another sizzling day of the summer. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, so this presentation basically is about the economic consequences of pandemics. It's a bit more about on the historical side, the history uh, of uh, economics. Normally, uh, we, we uh, at least the po uh, COVID-19, what it showed us is that pandemics have, have substantial effect on economic activity. It can, uh, if I say, if I state that it can bring down economies to its knees, uh, it won't be misplaced. So I, in this paper, uh, what I have done is that look, I looked at the historical episodes of pandemics and their consequences for the economy. Now, the interesting fact is that it goes back thousands of years. Pandemics are as old as uh, human civilization. And uh, a lot of them, at least since the time of uh, city-states in Greece, uh, they've been recorded, their effects have been recorded uh, bit by bit. And then after post-industrial revolution in detail. So we'll just quickly go through uh, the presentation and uh, what we uh, what I found out and what I've written down, jotted down. So recessions, recessions do have a long history, but there are two types. One, there are uh, those that are induced by economic phenomenon, purely economic. For example, bank runs, and the second one is that those uh, that are induced by bi biological phenomenon, the one that we are experiencing right now in the form of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Both are devastating uh, because they have. It takes significant toll upon the economies and history. One of the reasons that I wrote this paper, uh, one question that keeps creeping up, uh, coming up in a lot of the questions is that uh, why is this research? What's the importance of this particular research piece? Well, the importance of this research piece is that history uh, can offer us uh, a lot of uh, lessons in terms of how, how to deal with pandemics or what they've done and how countries have coped with them. So, Let's start with the literature review. Uh, the first time that uh, a, a writer mentioned the plagues and how they affected the economic activity was Thucydides. That's a Greek historian. And during the Peloponnesian Wars between Athens and Sparta, he wrote down about the plague of Athens. Uh, that was 430 before Common Era BC. And then later on, we find uh, 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 mention of the Justinian plague. Uh, by Princess Anna Comnenus in her Alexiad. Uh, this uh, plague uh, ravaged the uh, Byzantine Empire and caused a lot of damage to their economic activity. We have Cathedral Priory of Rochester. Uh, they had their registers in which they used to uh, note down a lot of things. And one of the things that they noted down in detail was the bubonic plague or the Black Death that struck Europe and put out half of its population, almost half of its population. Uh, estimates do differ, but uh, there is uh, there is uh, this general consensus that it's anywhere between 40 to 50 percent of the loss. Now, uh, in present times, uh, when we come to modern what we say research or the present research in uh, present times, there are quite a few. Uh, that you can divide uh, this kind of research into two uh, uh, types of research. One is that looks at uh, what happened in the history and wrote about it. The second is modeled simulation, simulation or modeling to gauge the effects of the past pandemics and the present ones or the future ones. So one of the uh, papers that I mentioned is from Hurley 
in 1997. And he uh, wrote about the tremendous transformation in Europe post Black Death. You have a we have a paper where Martin Cox and Figura that was one of the first papers that used simulation to gauge the effects of uh, a pandemic. So he they wrote about the Spanish influenza and uh, how it would uh, how it affected the United States. And one of the suggestions that they gave was that get at least sixty percent of the population vaccinated as quickly as possible if you want to negate the negative repercussions of a pandemic. Next, please. Then uh, there are two papers by Lawrence Summers. Uh, he's a famous economist. One was with Summers, uh, one was with Jameson and Fan, and they simulated to gauge the pandemic's demonstration in terms of lost income and late and illnesses. And what they concluded was that uh, the losses could be anywhere between 500 billion, at least 500 billion dollars per annum. Then there is a paper with uh, Cutler that uh, is from 2020. What they concluded was that the monetary losses from the global economy in a decade could be, due to COVID-19, could be $16 trillion, estimated to be $16 trillion. Half of those due, would be due to the COVID-induced recession, and half would be due to short and unhealthy lives of COVID affectees. Then there is Levy and Filippini, uh, one of the latest papers. Uh, they, what they conclude is that it is the developing nations that will suffer the most lasting damage. Why would that be? I will discuss later. I will come to this aspect later. Then there is jo uh, Joda Singh and Taylor, uh, whose paper, uh, they gauge the effect of real returns on assets. And they conclude that they tend to remain depressed for long due to when, whenever pandemic strike. Next, please. So we come to the economic consequences of uh, pandemics. Well, significant uh, negative repercussions of pandemics on the economy. First of all, I'll deal with the human capital. Uh, well, uh, what research has found out is that healthy population tend to have uh, positive effects upon the GDP. And this was one of the papers that was done was by Kristalina Georgieva. She is now president at the World Bank. Uh, but in contrast, poor health reduces GDP. This is a paper by Remes, Dewhurst, and Wurzel that says that poor health causes a decline in GDP growth by 15% per year. So significant toll on population in the form of mortalities and ill health. And since labor and human capital is a substantial input to GDP, therefore we can expect neg negative effects upon GDP. And I, we've seen that uh, in our case, in Pakistan's case, we saw last year that the growth turned negative in many, many decades. Uh, Filippini, he has a paper in, out in 2021, and he uh, suggests that global deaths due to COVID-19 would be equivalent to 16 point, uh, it's are equivalent to actually 16.9% of lost global GDP. That is still now. Uh, as we go forward in the coming years, I'm sure this toll would perhaps be more than what uh, we've uh, encountered till now. So effects on labor supply negative shock uh, to labor supply. Historically, empires weakened due to devastating plagues. For example, Justinian plague in the Byzantine Empire, which I just mentioned. Uh, due, due to low labor supply, there was lower taxation base, uh, less income, and then obviously lower agricultural production. Now remember that, though, that in those times, agriculture was the main base of GDP growth, land and agriculture. So when you have loss of labor that can till the lands, uh, you have loss of income, basically. After that, you have the black uh, example of black death in Europe, uh, where it was due to a significant portion of uh, population being wiped out. You have it was very hard to find labor to till lands, leading to lower produce and lower aggregate demand. Um, higher cost of doing business uh, because you don't have much labor to work for, uh, with, and labor supply effects more pronounced if age cohort is relatively younger. Uh, that is because it's uh, most of the productivity surges and most of the income earning potential, it comes from a younger and healthy population. That's well known. Please. Now, this one is pretty important and this one is pretty interesting too. Uh, one of the economic consequences. That's drastic redistribution of wealth. Historically, pandemics have led to drastic redistribution of wealth with the flow from top to the bottom tiers. Uh, and this was uh, this has been confirmed uh, many a times by research. Uh, 
in recent times, Walter Scheidel, he is at uh, Harvard, and then Thomas Piketty, whose capital in the 21st century is very well known. Their research shows that extreme and transient inequalities tend to be erased by extreme events like pandemics. So I gave the example in the paper, I gave a few examples. One example is of Rome, the Roman Empire uh, and the Cyprian plague that changed the power and wealth structure of Rome. The second example, uh, Black Death, the bubonic plague that struck Europe, wealth flowed to laborers as their wages rose tremendously due to labor shortages. So uh, historically, and one another important point from policy viewpoint is that this, this kind of redistribution historically had be had taken place without any government intervention. Uh, that was a natural phenomenon, except maybe in one case, but uh, normally it was natural without any government intervention. Another consequence is uh, noticeable upsurge in demand for medical services, medical personnel, medical devices, medicines. As supply fails to meet unexpected demand surge, prices do go up. And this difference between demand and supply leads to expansion of black market activities. We saw this very recently. Uh, the in-demand medicines uh, going off the shelves and uh, being sold in black mar black at ridiculously high rates, whether it's oxygen cylinder or a particular type of medicine that is used in co to treat COVID. Uh, next, please. And then obviously there is the enhanced or larger government role. Post-industrial revolution, governments actively involved in mitigating adverse economic impacts of pandemics. Uh, added ex expenditures plus fiscal stimulus packages. These tend to be add to overall public debt, uh, which is the general phenomena. Um, uh, there are exceptions, uh, but in general, uh, when uh, countries do come up with, governments do come up with fiscal stimulus packages, you see the public debt to GDP ratio climb up a bit. Uh, there is a research, by Ho research piece by Horn, Trebesh, and Reinhardt uh, in 2020, they estimated that between 1790 and 2015, there were 230,000 official commitments related to government level support through grants, loans, and guarantees. And as per their estimate, their value equals $15 trillion. Uh, government investment instruments like T-bills most sought after as inv investors and household flee to safety during times of pandemics. These tend to be most liquid and keep markets afloat. Uh, so let's go to lessons. What what kind of lessons can we learn for the parents, uh, especially important from a policy uh, point of view, is that goal, a very good healthcare system is imperative in these kind of instances. Then there is good governance needed in terms of marshalling resources to fight off these uh, adverse consequences of pandemics, of recessions. Quality healthcare infrastructure and proper regulation ensure a smooth response. Pharmaceutical industry's role is pretty critical. And this is pretty critical uh, because I've done research on this, uh, on this matter. And in all these instances, if you take pharmaceutical industries uh, working, quality healthcare infrastructure, good governance, good healthcare system, I'm sure it won't come as a surprise to any of you that we lack severely in all of those. The pharmaceutical industry is nowhere near its potential where it should be. And a lot of it has to do with the regulations of the government, but that's a topic for another time. Uh, another important lesson is that uh, the governments need to be sound in terms of their money management to keep the wheels of the economy in motion and restore business confidence. Uh, there are many instances in history where money mischief or mismanagement in terms of handling resources led to very even more adverse consequences later on. Long term, you need to have a long term plan for mitigating pandemics effects as in terms of poverty, because poverty is poverty do, does tend to rise as we are seeing right now. So you need to have a long term effect to combat that need to be aware of other health challenges too, as resources get towards pandemics. Now, when we talk about Pakistan, Pakistan does not just face the COVID-19 battle, but as you would, uh, as you definitely, uh, you definitely acknowledge, definitely acknowledge is that we are facing other challenges like polio and hepatitis. So resources shouldn't just be focused on COVID. They are, and for good reason, but it shouldn't blind us to the other side of it. Now, is the present age any different? This is an additional uh, one, which I found very interesting uh, because a lot of people ask this question that, okay, this is something that happened in history. So is this repeating just now or is the present age any different? In certain respects, 
yes, the present day differs from the past trends. Uh, how? One, we are a very globalized world uh, where everybody is connected uh, more than ever. But one thing that happens with this kind of globalization is that viral transmissions are very quick to transmit across borders. We saw this uh, uh, out of Wuhan, out of China, it quickly traveled to Europe it quickly travel and from there to other parts of the world. So more dense population mean wider spread probability sends a good health system. Uh, not that it doesn't mean that you need to redensify. Uh, that would be disastrous as far as economic growth is concerned, but you need to have a good and efficient health system um, uh, to counter that. Climate change challenges, health spread of viral infection. Uh, you must have heard about Zika virus in Brazil. A lot of it has to do with, had to do with cl climate change. Uh, more outbreaks feared in the future, a more coordinated world effort through forums such as WHO and UN. Uh, that kind of effort uh, in historical terms was lacking, but now the world seems to be coming together in, uh, through these forums to combat these kind of challenges. Technological advances, obviously we have vaccines in record time. This has never happened before. That in such a record time, you'll have <clears throat> a vaccine to counter a pandemic. And unlike the past, especially significant episodes like the Black Death, the flow of wealth. Now, this is pretty important, again, from a policy point of view, that uh, what I stated previously was that you had redistribution of wealth from top to bottom in historical episodes. But this is not happening now. Uh, the, uh, what we have, uh, what the evidence till now suggests is that this is not happening, which is pretty concerning which is pretty concerning. And that would also mean that governments will need to do something, an added role for them. Um, thank you. This is it for the presentation. Thank you, Shai Saab. So the discussion part today on this paper is Mr. Omar Sadiq. Omar Saab, can you please take over? The floor, floor, floor is yours. Yeah, OK. Thank you very much, Shai uh, Saab, for giving me this opportunity. and. That's up for a very nice presentation. Well, uh, the paper is very well written indeed. It gives us a very good account of historical, uh, uh, I mean, evolution of uh, pandemics in, in the world from right from uh, 5000 BC up till COVID-19. Uh, first of all, I would, uh, there is something that is missing from this account is what measures uh, were taken during other pandemics that were uh, that were different from uh, to prevent the uh, spread of the pandemic uh, during those times. Uh, we, it would be a good idea to give that uh, account so, the, so that we can compare how uh, different it is those steps were from the steps taken during COVID-19. Secondly, uh, what is different in this pandemic is that uh, if we, the most recent pandemic before this COVID-19 is, and perhaps the most famous is that Spanish flu of uh, 1918 that happened during the World War I. Uh, in, in that pan pandemic, it was uh, mainly the older population that was affected and uh, mostly it was uh, the older people who died. So, but in this, uh, sorry, uh, I'm saying the other way around. It was the younger population that was mostly most affected and died. So that had uh, grave consequences for the human capital. What is different in this pandemic, uh, pandemic is uh, that we have seen that uh, in this pandemic, it is mostly the older people that are being affected and younger people are uh, relatively less affected. So probably it won't have as much uh, effect on human capital loss as it had during the that Spanish flu pandemic. And as we have seen that uh, in, in case of Pakistan, though the GDP figures are controversial, but still it is the consensus is that economy has grown. So probably, and there's also another uh, article that I can't remember the author of the article that he is also mentioned that uh, perhaps the uh, uh, economic effects of COVID-19 won't be as 
uh, grave as they appear to be. Why? Because as uh, Shahid has mentioned that uh, we are able to come up with a vaccine in a record, record amount of time, though it might not be as effective, but still it will be able to curtail the spread of the pandemic and that will have probably uh, uh, co uh, consequences, uh, good consequences for the economies world over. And uh, Shahid also talked about that we are, uh, we need to have good uh, efficient healthcare system. Well, except for in China, we have seen that uh, the economies the world over have uh, not been able to handle these, this pandemic uh, uh, in terms of medical uh, uh, <clears throat> provision as efficiently as they should have. That is, there is a difference between uh, uh, Chinese uh, model and the other model. We can say that uh, the New Zealand, New Zealand uh, was able to handle it properly, but New Zealand is also a special case. Why? Because it is a very thinly populated country and it is rel relatively detached from the rest of the world in terms of uh, uh, its geographical location. So if we have Umar Sab, your voice is gone. Hello. Can I just hear Umar Sab? Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you, sir. Yes, sir. Umar, I can I can hear you. I can okay. hear you, Risa. Okay. Now I can also hear. So yeah, so I was saying that uh, New Zealand is uh, geographically uh, rather detached from the rest of the world. So that's why it was able to cope with the situation better than the other economies. So yes, we need to have efficient uh, uh, medical system, but in the presence of market economy, and also it is a, a unique event. A pandemic is always a unique event. It, uh, uh, so it is not easy to prepare for such unseen, uh, unforeseen events. So it will be, hard for, especially for developing countries to have the uh, medical systems in place that are able to cope with the damages uh, brought forth by the pandemics. Moreover, <clears throat> uh, I've also read that uh, in, during the Spanish influenza, the economic consequences were not that dire. Why? Because, uh, uh, during that time, uh, the First World War was going on and all the resources were being implemented, uh, were being channeled towards, uh, you know, producing for uh, war. So that's the reason that uh, the economic consequences were not as grave as, uh, 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 as much human capital was lost. Why? Because uh, there are some figures that real government spending in the US, for example, was 38% of the GDP during uh, the First World War. So it has an important lesson for uh, the current pandemic that if we are able to, uh, no one is saying that we should go into a war to, you know, uh, to cope with the uh, economic effects of the pandemic, but it has an important lesson that if the government spending is channeled in, in, in the way that it can, uh, you know, uh, give impetus to uh, aggregate demand, so it will have it will mitigate the uh, uh, bad consequences of the pandemic. Why uh, this pandemic is also different from other times because uh, the quarantine measures and the lockdown measures that were taken were uh, perhaps unprecedented too. During this uh, Spanish influenza, they, uh, they were also, uh, history tells us that uh, during that time, church gatherings were banned, schools were closed, but because of <clears throat> the war, the uh, economic activity went on in, uh, especially in those uh, uh, industries that uh, were feeding into the war. In case of the current pandemic, the uh, situation is different. Why? Because uh, all, almost all the countries in the world uh, took immediate steps to uh, lock down their economy. So perhaps that's the reason the 
uh, economic consequences are different, but at the same time, because of uh, 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 you know uh, <coughs> fear that uh, uh, it will affect the poor people disproportionately more more than the rich people. So, like uh, we did in Pakistan, the government took up uh, perhaps the right steps and implemented a smart lockdown. So. These are, I think, some of the things that are different from the past pandemics. And two, it will have a very grave economic consequences, but they are lessons, as uh, Shahid said, that they are lessons to be had from the previous pandemics. One lesson is that if we are able to channel government spending in the way that it can uh, give uh, impetus to the aggregate demand, we can somehow mitigate the uh, uh, worst uh, bad economic consequences of the pandemic. Overall, it is a very well written paper. And as Shahid mentioned, uh, such papers are important because history do have lessons for the presence. History does matter. And uh, we should pay heed to these uh, uh, lessons for, God forbid, if there is any other pandemic in the future, it will uh, probably, uh, the current experience will give us a good, uh, I mean, account of how we can deal with the uh, such pandemics in the future. For one thing, we need to have an efficient health system in the place, and hopefully uh, the governments world over would learn from these uh, uh, experiences. Other than that, I have not, like I said, uh, it's a very well written paper. Perhaps uh, uh, that will be taken care of uh, while finalizing the working paper. There, uh, the tables should be numbered properly because it's hard to, you know, go back and forth without table numbering. Other than that, I think uh, these are the comments that I have on the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Masab, for our detailed and uh, great comments. I hope uh, uh, this will help uh, Shaisa to further improve the paper. Shaisa, would you like to? Uh, Dr. Idris, we can't hear you. Uh, can everybody else hear me? Shaisa? Yeah. Hey, Dr. Uh, Sab i can hear you uh, just yes. a uh, quick uh, uh, reply to umar's observation umar thank you so much it was a very very nice observations uh, very relevant observation i would uh, say so uh, just let me go through them quickly uh, you, you mentioned about uh, historical measures and what uh, and details of those measures the only issue was Umar, that i couldn't if i had gone through every single measure or even most of them what countries had done uh, it would have made for a very very long paper and i just didn't want to do that the main message of the paper was that look it has happened before and these are some of the general lessons that we have learned so yes uh, perhaps in another paper uh, i could go in more detail uh, that would make for another paper. Uh, if I had added it in this paper, it would have made for a very, very long paper. Now, Spanish influenza, you uh, mentioned this, your second point. Uh, more younger people affected, but not now. Uh, true, true. I don't have the exact numbers, to be honest. You must have uh, come uh, across those numbers. But it's not that they weren't affected. They were affected. One of the things that uh, we should be uh, one of the things to keep in perspective is that uh, unlike, unlike the Spanish influenza that was during the First World War, uh, the world has come le leaps and bounds in terms of technology and the know-how of dealing with pandemics, whether it's SARS, whether it's Ebola virus. And so they have a lot of lessons. So they acted quickly, governments acted quickly, some very quickly like China and some not that quickly like those in Europe and US. So uh, and the the uh, nature of viruses, they do tend to differ. This particular virus, this attacks the uh, uh, respiratory system. And as you'd imagine, and as you uh, most of you, you would know, 
the respiratory system of old, older people uh, relatively older people that's a bit weak so that's one of the reasons uh, that was not so in the spanish influenza case this particular virus attacks the uh, respiratory system and that's one of the reasons that a lot of older people a, a lot of older folks have uh, experienced mortality the third point economy has grown perhaps covid-19 is not as destructive as before true uh, and again if uh, governments had on good authority and had good lessons a lot of people wrote on that a lot of economists like larry summers paul krugman they all wrote about it as soon as the pandemic struck they urged the government to come up with stimulus packages they urged the government that look this is a lesson from history and you need to do this 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 thing uh, to prevent the catastrophe happening and uh, mitigating the effects so perhaps that is when and i'm sure this is one of the reasons that covid-19 till now hasn't been that destructive as before now good healthcare system except you mentioned china that others did suffer to uh, and if efficient health system is not necessarily a counter in this kind of uh, situation when a pandemic strikes i agree this is not a normal circumstance this is a uh, uh, irregular should we say circumstances but one thing that i would uh, like to uh, comment here is that the chinese took it seriously but the europeans and the americans and even us a lot of us in uh, india pakistan they didn't take it seriously at the very start i remember a video being posted on internet and it's available on youtube uh, it's about an italian city when the pandemic struck china and china was warning the world and a lot a lot of people were warning that it could travel outside uh, i remember that video that they held a march uh, or a kind of a festive march in italy where they were poking fun at the pandemic and the virus uh, they had masks that uh, and they were don't they had uh, don't don't mask that looked like viruses and they were dancing to its tune uh, thinking that it's not going to affect them and then in the us you had uh, a duffer in the form of donald trump sorry but uh, he thought that pandemic is nothing he didn't even used to wear a mask so it's yeah you do efficient healthcare system kind of calamity like covid-19 when it strikes it's difficult to contain but still the countries you need to have good management and sound common sense to contain that in a lot of cases we didn't have that spanish influenza not as dire because real government spending is higher uh, perhaps that is i don't have the figures but th- perhaps that is true uh, now good quarantine measures yes that's another lesson that we learned from history if you go back as far as uh, the black death or bubonic plague in europe and if you read those accounts the one thing that they did was pretty good was that they quarantined a lot of people whatever whichever family they used to find that were had uh, that was affected they used to close uh, clamp down on them and keep them quarantined to their homes so thank you I, and i'll definitely look at the table numbering thank you umar thank you very much sir thank you Shai sir, I have a comment. That uh, can you hear me? Sure. Uh, maybe you can also try to document uh, some of the positive effects of pandemics, like um, it is said about the Black Death that uh, this led to scarcity of labor and that in turn contributed to the end of feudalism in UK. The positive consequence of uh, the current one could be that. Uh, the world's march towards technology and towards going virtual would increase so maybe oh, okay uh, yes that's a fair point that's a fair point uh, so i i have already mentioned a few things in the paper perhaps i perhaps you can document effects like these as well okay okay thank you uh, a fair observation doctor any question from the floor ji जी कोई सवाल पूछना चाहेगा हैंड्स प्लेस कोई मुझे नजर नहीं आ रहा है अभी तक हेलो अस्सलाम वालेकुम जी वालेकुम अस्सलाम डॉक्टर साहब मैं आई हैव जस्ट सवाल टू क्वेरी फ्रॉम डॉक्टर शाहिद के मतलब डिड ही डिड ही ऑब्जर्व एनी इंपैक्ट ऑफ एग्रीकल्चर ऑन सप्लाई साइड और और डिमांड साइड because on demand side there are impact but uh, especially in some country like underdeveloped country like pakistan 
I mean, there is, I mean, although price, prices should uh, decline uh, because supply declines, demand declines, sorry. So, but in case of Pakistan, because inflationary effect was dominant, so prices continue to shoot up rather than declining. But what about the, the supply, supply side? So did he observe in any specific country, developing or underdeveloping country, where we can see that pandemic has affected the supply side seriously? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Abed uh, Sahib. Uh, yes, definitely I've observed uh, this and it's uh, clear for all to see prices in Pakistan. So suppose uh, if, I, if we talk about the price of poultry products that's been skyrocket skyrocketing, as you said that uh, what economic theory suggests is that when there is a pandemic, there is a recession, prices should be going down. But instead, what we are uh, witnessing in a lot of uh, in the uh, in the form of poultry and in agricultural products, uh, the, the prices are going up. One of the reasons is that uh, the failure to understand uh, the breaking of or the discontinuation of value chains. Uh, if you can put it down uh, the, to mafias and everything, but it's not just mafias. Uh, now, in case of poultry, let me give you an example. Uh, poultry feed used to come from China. But as soon as the pandemic struck, the Chinese closed their borders and stopped the, uh, uh, exporting poultry feed to Pakistan. Uh, now, that is one reason that the uh, prices of chicken have been going up and been stuck at one place. The other uh, alternative, aside from China, for poultry feed was Brazil or some South American country. But exporting from the, uh, importing from there would have meant a lot more in terms of price because it's expensive if you figure in the freight cost too. Uh, now, one more thing that uh, we would all need to remember, we do well to remember is that when these supply constraints were in motion and still are, uh, government has been propping up demand through stimulus packages. So you have a situation where demand uh, didn't fell much or in fact is back to normal where it should be. And if uh, we, the figures are to be believed of the GDP growth, then uh, demand is rising as per capita income is rising, but supply constraints are still there. And unless they are addressed, uh, global value chains come back to normal. You'd have these uh, supply constraints. Thank you. Okay. Any other question? So, if there's no question, then we'll move to the next paper. Shall I move to you? Okay. So the next paper is uh, by three authors, Dr. Naseem Faraz, Dr. Mahmoud Khaled, and Dr. Muhammad Nasser on <clears throat> VAT gap, uh, the tax expenditure due to exemptions, et cetera. Measuring VAT gap in Pakistan, a top-down analysis. So, Dr. Naseem, are you going to present or it's uh, Dr. Mahmoud Khalid? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, well, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Idris, and thank you, everyone, for joining this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, let me share. I'm going to present, Dr. Idris. Okay, sure. Let, Please go ahead. Let me share my screen. <clears throat> okay, uh, so today we are going to present VAT gap in Pakistan. This is a joint effort by me and Dr. Mahmoud Khalid, uh, Senior Research Economist at Pride, and Mohammed Nasser, Associate Professor at IPA. We all know that tax to GDP ratio. <clears throat> the very famous tax to GDP ratio always overs around 10% in Pakistan. And one of the core reasons for low, low revenue payment is uh, because of the tax expenditures and the non-compliance of the tax law. 
tax expenditures means uh, some kind of exemptions, provisions, and special treatment to the some industries or sectors by the government. It is on um, uh, uh, something which is created by the government, and non-compliance of the tax law, which is some kind of you know the tax evasion or the avoidance of the tax taxes by the uh, uh, taxpayers. So these kind of revenue uh, uh, foregone create gap between what is your potential tax base and what actually you collected from the uh, taxes. This is the first step to, you know, when you talk about fixing up the tax policy, you know that what is the extent of uh, the tax evasion and the, what is the extent of the uh, policy gap. So unpaid taxes, you know, they put overall uh, burden uh, on finances, public finances, and it gives uh, incentive to government to raise either raise taxes or tax rate uh, to meet the revenue targets, which again put burden on those who are contributing. Uh, that is unfair and create uh, distortion in the economy. So uh, this study is not going to uh, um, estimate the overall tax gap. Uh, we are going to estimate the VAT gap in Pakistan, since the sales tax is the has largest portion in, 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 in uh, the total tax, tax revenue. So we are focusing on the bad gap in Pakistan. So one part is known, tax expenditure to us. Uh, look at this picture. Uh, since 20, 2012 to uh, 2013, you know, that tax expenditure was uh, less than 5% uh, as a share of the total taxes. And it increasing gradually over the time. And uh, it was like more than 20% in 2014. And then again, it was on average 18% uh, between 2014 and 2018. And it again increased in 2018 to 2019. And uh, again, a little bit to fall in 2020. So on average, we have a tax expenditure 20 to 25 percent. It is known uh, this is something which is, uh, you know, uh, forgotten by government uh, in terms of tax expenditure. It is 20 to 25 percent of the total sales collection. But the main thing is we don't know what is our potential sales tax bear, uh, base or the VAT base. We don't know non-compliance of the uh, sales taxes or the VAT. So to calculate the overall uh, wet base, we have to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, estimate the potential uh, tax uh, wet base, as well as we have to estimate the non-compliance part. So a little, about, a little bit about the conceptual framework. What is the wet gap? Wet gap refers to the wet policy gap or the wet compliance gap. In case of Pakistan, we have both. The wet policy gap, as I mentioned, tax expenditure, uh, which is created by the government in terms as a policy decision, and it is uh, something like potential weight wet collectible under a benchmark reg regime. Benchmark regime ka matlab hai ki har koi banda jo hai taxable hai, har har commodity taxable hai. There is no preferential treatment. There is no exemption. There is no provisions, uh, special provision by the government. There is no tax zero uh, rating uh, by the government and uh, minus the VAT collectible under the current regime. Jo ki government is work take regime follow kari hai. Government is giving having some tax code where she, where government applies, uh, you know, the tax uh, special treatment and the exemptions and zero rating. Okay, so uh, this is a policy gap. Uh, this is how we calculate the policy gap and the VAT compliance gap is potential VAT collectible under the current regime. Yani, our current regime kya hai, jo actually government practice kar rahi hai, and then what actually you collect um, uh, 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 under the head of the VAT. The difference between them gives you the non-compliance of the taxes or the tax avoidance or the tax evasion. Um, so we have, uh, you know, this is a basic conceptual framework, but we have some estimate on the VAT gap uh, in past in Pakistan, for Pakistan. Uh, Ahmed and Ryder, they have estimated VAT gap uh, in 2018. 
it. And uh, the gap, this suggested gap is 36% of the total uh, collection by FPR. Uh, but problem with, with that uh, with that estimated bad gap is that it is the old one, like since 2018, now more than 13 years. And secondly, they used very old uh, sales base, like 1991 to 91, even, uh, you know, uh, to, until 2008, um, a lot of uh, uh, you know structural changes. So the 1991 tax base uh, can't represent the actual. Uh, uh, it's not a representative tax uh, sales tax base. And secondly, they applied uh, um, a simple uh, GST rate rather than um, connecting the VAT rate uh, commodity VAT rate. So our study, uh, after one thing, they uh, we update estimate these estimates, and we rely on the recent one uh, input output table, uh, uh, which gives up the sales tax base, and uh, we also connect uh, each sector with the the commodity level wet rate to calculate the potential wet, and in this way we try to minimize the as much the error as much as we can do. So what data we uh, require to estimate the VAT, uh, uh, VAT gap? First, we need sales tax, bar, sales tax base, and uh, as well as we need uh, the commodity rate, which is actually collected by the FBR. And secondly, we need uh, the potential the tax base, uh, sales tax base uh, in the economy, which, which can be derived from the input output table. So input output table, uh, you know, uh, estimate the potential VAT uh, from sales, help us to estimate, uh, you know, the VAT from the sales. Secondly, it provides information, since it provides information on the final consumption, as well as the production and the use of the goods and services. It also provides very crucial information on the intermediate uh, and the value of the primary use and the value of imports, exports, and the value of investment expenditure. Uh, it provides necessary information to model Pakistan's potential sales tax base. And it includes taxable supplies, and uh, it includes information on the overall VAT collected, and it, uh, it includes information on input credits and the refunds on the export. So we, 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 uh, we have this input output table, uh, uh, recent one um, for 2017, we re-benchmark this model to reflect uh, the level of Pakistan's economy by the sector value for 2020 uh, using the national accounts data. Here is a commodity level uh, tax rate. So we got a commodity VAT rate like for more than uh, 1900 commodities and we uh, average out uh, and connected it to the input output uh, 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 sectors because we have to have some rate for at least uh, according to the uh, sector, which uh, whatever we have in the input output tables. So this is the average weight rate and, uh, as per uh, input output table. So use uh, so this input output table and this is the VAT rate. We uh, connect each other and try to estimate the VAT gap. So we use you know as I said we applied a top down approach. A top down approach is something like we where you work with the macroeconomic framework, in which macro wide is important because we have to have to work in a general equilibrium uh, environment so that we calculate uh, the exemptions and the uh, the provision, the professional treatment and the tax provision, which is uh, not observable directly from the, uh, the taxpayer data uh, collected by the FPR. So uh, first, um, there are two sides of uh, calculation. Uh, we can use uh, any uh, of this approach, like consumption approach or the value added approach, just like the calculation uh, for GDP. The consumption approach is something like, you know, you use the input output table uh, that provide information or also provide information on the final consumption of the consumer goods, now consumers and uh, by the consumption by the government and the exports. And the final consumption of commodity, one thing one must, uh, one has to has noticed that it in also includes the VAT in the value, like saw packages has to be in tax, so value will be given like 117, you can 
I can't apply the commodity rate on that 117. First, you have to have, uh, you know, exclude that VAT uh, from the final value of final consumption value. So we eliminate that VAT from the consumption and apply the commodity uh, level first. And then we uh, apply the commodity VAT rate to calculate the potential um, policy gap in a way like for the first one, uh, first bar represents the problem. VAT compliance gap in which final consumption minus VAT and the commodity multiplied commodity gives you uh, the, <coughs> the potential tax base under the current regime and minus we actual uh, we subtract the actual collected VAT by the FBR. In this way, we calculate the VAT compliance gap and the VAT policy gap is something like under the current uh, no, uh, I mean the benchmark. Uh, using the benchmark, what is what you have the uh, the potential sales tax. The first part we finance uh, final consumption minus VAT, and then we apply the uh, the tax, and then we get the you know, potential ta sales tax base in Pakistan. And then uh, the second part we subtract the um, under the current uh, regime what we uh, can collect, like financial uh, finance final consumption minus VAT at commodity C and then apply that um, the commodity uh, VAT rate. The sum of the both uh, compliance and the policy gap give, gives you the total uh, VAT gap. Similar, uh, similar. This, is, this was the consumption side approach and this one is the, uh, the next one is the value added approach. Uh, Evaluated approach, we uh, first calculate the tax base. Tax base is something like what you have the value added at domestic level and plus what you import and minus uh, to uh, you know reduce the doubling from the domestic uh, value added, you reduce the, uh, you know, uh, the use by the government and uh, by the exporters and the investment. That gives you the potential uh, sales tax base and 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 uh, on that tax base, uh, sales tax base, you apply the benchmark tax rate like GST seventeen percent on the domestic one and uh, roughly twenty to twenty one percent on the imports. That way, you get the potential VAT policy. Uh, no potential sales. Uh, potential sales VAT, and then you uh, you know subtract again similar to consumption approach. Uh, uh, the VAT you collect under the current uh, regime, the equation five. So uh, uh, we can collect, you know, we can estimate the uh, potential VAT uh, gap even uh, using the consumption approach, but we re reconciled it, these estimate using the value added approach as well. So what actually uh, FBR collect in 2020? So we have, um, you know, uh, the VAT collected in 2020, um, it is roughly 16.5 uh, billion dollar in terms of uh, dollar. And uh, domestic uh, VAT is 10 billion, 10.565 billion dollar. And the rest of the amount uh, coming from the imports. So we have now information what we VAT collect actually collect VAT uh, uh, FBR collect uh, the VAT in 2020. Next, we estimate the potential uh, VAT gap using uh, 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 using the uh, consumption approach. Okay. The first, uh, you know, the column gives you the sale tax base, which is uh, you coming from the input output table in which we uh, discuss, uh, use the formula that we just discussed before. And this is something, uh, the second uh, column is actual VAT, which is collected by the gov government FBR. And the difference of this base minus uh, uh, the actual VAT gives you the $5 billion. $5 billion is the VAT gap in 2020. And it is 30% uh, of the total actually collected by the FBR. This is compliance gap. Similarly, we, we, we uh, estimate uh, the potential policy gap um, in which we have, first again, we have sales tax base under the current, uh, under the benchmark regime, that is $25.7 billion. And uh, what we can get from uh, the, uh, under uh, current regime, it is 22, 0.2 uh, billion dollars 
and their difference is three point billion dollar. This is something uh, you know uh, under the uh, umbrella of uh, um, of the of the uh, exemptions, the provisions, and the special treatment given by the government. This is the revenue for government by the government. So it is twenty one percent of the actual uh, collected uh, VAT by the government. We reconcile these estimate uh, using the value added approach. Uh, uh, more or less uh, similar result we get when we apply the value added approach. Uh, it is again 30% of the actual, uh, the compliance gap is, you know, 30% uh, of the actually collected by the FBR. It is $5.14 billion. And the policy gap, which is created by the government, it is $3.8 billion. And again, it is 20, roughly 23% of actual collected by the FBR. So these are the overall, uh, I mean, uh, the total uh, compliance gap and the policy gap. We can also see this uh, uh, a little bit, this, this aggregated picture of this VAT gap. Uh, it is concentrated, if you look at the last column, same formula will be applied uh, uh, for the sectors, uh, same approach, same methodology will be applied uh, for all sectors. And we get, uh, you know, the picture uh, of the wet gap distribution. Uh, you see that uh, it is more concentrated in the food, uh, food beverages and tobacco uh, sector and textile sector and uh, the chemical sector and the electricity, gas, and water and supply sectors. So majorly, a VAT gap is driven by these sectors. So here are some conclusion. Uh, we, our estimated results suggest that the VAT gap is roughly 3% of the GDP, like $8.6 billion is the total VAT gap, $5.1 billion dollar caused by the compliance gap and 3.6 to 8 billion caused by the, um, the policy gap. The total 8.6 billion dollar is the 3.3 percent of the total GDP, uh, which is foregone uh, due to the non-compliance behavior and the policy uh, decision. The non-compliance gap is approximately, as we suggested, that 31 percent of the total VAT collected in year 2020. And the um, and the policy gap is 21% of the total uh, collected by the FBR. So these gaps reflect the issues with the tax policy and the large tax gap suggests that the system may not be, uh, uh, maybe underperforming in terms of revenue yield and it creating distortion in the economy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dries. Uh, Dr. Dries, sir, please unmute yourself, sir. Thank you, Dr. Naseem, for computing the wet cap and uh, telling us that uh, what's the size of this and what could be the implications. Uh, perhaps we need to discuss the implications, but I will come to it. But uh, let's first move to the discussion. Uh, Dr. Ekhtahar is the discussion for this paper. Dr. Ekhtahar, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Idris, uh, and thank you, Naseem Khaled and Nasser, for giving me the opportunity to read your paper, uh, learn you. and contribute in certain ways, I hope. Uh, okay, if I uh, analyze it, so it is a good piece of research where authors have touched upon a very important topic, which is definitely VAT, despite being a, an indirect tax. Uh, optimal taxation is what can save us from deficits and debt trap ultimately without distorting uh, output. So the optimal word should be given weightage. Uh, we somehow this paper touches upon. However, along with focusing collection only, uh, we should also be vigilant uh, regarding the incidents, which is why there is a continued debate concerning direct and indirect taxation. So this paper is completely silent about that. Maybe as per your discussion, it seems that it is a series of papers which you are planning. So maybe uh, you will discuss that or address that in the rest of the papers, but being the first paper, if you discuss that here as well, it will provide basis for the next research, for the future research. Uh, 
the paper do discuss a certain aspects, specifically the collection potential part. However, I think it would be better if the rationale for exemptions and incidents is also touched upon. So if I look at the positives of the paper, uh, it's a uh, number one discussion in the paper is very focused, precise, and to the point. So that's the great point. Uh, secondly, it uses a very comprehensible, simple set of tools to understand a very major question of significance. So that's the best part of this uh, paper. As far as shortcomings or the room for improvement uh, is concerned, so starting from a simple thing that uh, citations and references are very limited. There is only one uh, study referred to, uh, plus there are certain citations missing like ADB input output table, no reference added, uh, pilots work, no reference added. So the proper literature review section or an enriched introduction and background section is lacking in this paper. So uh, better uh, aid uh, relevant literature and recent evidence, which will definitely uh, add value to this paper. Secondly, my impression is that despite doing a very laborious detailed work, the paper somehow is flat in communication. The paper somehow lake in impressing the reader. So the questions like, why do we need to have this analysis? What is the importance, significance? It should be a part of the introduction. It should be explicitly explained that why indirect taxation and why within indirect taxation VAT and why within VAT, uh, why to hit exemptions. It will give a reader an impetus to read further and learn as you provide good uh, methodology at the end and analysis at the end of the paper. Uh, secondly, the, the area where the paper can be improved, like I'm not discussing the methodology because you have explained it well, uh, the execution is well, the message is clear because your focus was that. I'm just focusing on the points which can improve the readership or which can give a better, clearer idea uh, or persuasions uh, for reader uh, to learn this topic, or to learn about this topic. So the third point is that the, uh, the paper should precisely link policy and practice. And that's specifically with regard to the PIDES work that we have already been doing this taxation stuff in recent past over the last one year, starting from Tobacco and rest of the work, uh, Khaled is already there in Arthur's list. So if, uh, that thing can be uh, aided like what are the facts and figures and what were the practices, what are the practices, what should be the practices uh, that will definitely add value to this paper. The most important is that a clearer conceptual framework is needed. You have added conceptual framework, but it somehow uh, looks incomplete because definitely 30th June is approaching so I can understand the rush, but looking at the worth of the analysis, uh, you should definitely give some time to develop a better framework which can present the transmission mechanism, the issues being faced by allowing, uh, the potential issues to be faced by allowing tax exemptions like compliance cost, distortions in the market, or any such issues. So that should be there in the conceptual framework. And I think, uh, um, graphical presentation, where, where to start, where are the bumps and where to end would be the best way to communicate. So this is most important for informed policy making that yes, compliance may be uh, like uh, 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 exemptions may be necessary, but what will it cost to the uh, economy and the compliance cost would be definitely higher. So uh, second last, the author should keep in mind and add a para on why certain exemptions are made, uh, are given by a government or needed by a sector. Is there any, like what I want to, like if I'm doing the paper, I would add a title, is there any rationale for such exemptions? Because I'm imagining that 
is why it is in the debate now a policy maker a section officer or somebody picks this paper and says okay we don't need any exemptions just finish everything so what will happen then you have in table 6 food and beverages and other uh, water sanitation or water supply or something at the end so as well as you have the petroleum where the uh, collection is more than desired so these exemptions should be explained and definitely it will improve the quality of the people lastly being an indirect tax uh, authors should mention that even after universal implementation what would be the consequences with respect to incidence of taxation taxation and then again i'm saying in context of a misinformed or less informed policy maker that this paper should communicate both both the pros as well as the cons of universal uh, vat taxation bridging the gap or uh elimination of uh, exemptions so you should present both the perspective definitely your focus is more on the gap but that's how i think that this paper can be more worth of uh, and help in better uh, policy maker both for the maker as well as for the student who is going to understand out of it so that's all from my side good luck thank you dr sahad <laughs> for detailed comments and i hope this would help uh, the authors to improve the paper dr nasim maybe perhaps you can add to this uh, one or two comments from me and then you can answer together sure so i would just i would just like to ask um, what are the policy implications of the paper can the government take a decision on the basis of this paper to do away with this or that exemption or to increase exemptions from, for some sectors perhaps uh, a detailed analysis would be required for that so perhaps uh, what you can do is what the authors can do is that at least uh, list down the exemptions available to different sectors especially the sectors that have a large uh, gap that is textile and others <clears throat> chemical etc so uh, one question i also have about the methodology that for example if we know that uh, um, most of the sectors are taxed at the rate of 17% of gst and for example uh, the uh, textile is zero rated so can it be just compute directly what is the uh, tax expenditure rather than going through this roundabout way of this approach um, if we know the production of textile and so you can compute the tax revenue that would be that the government can earn if it uh, the tax rate was 17% so that is basically the tax expenditure so why not approach, uh, adopt this kind of approach so for policy implications uh, perhaps uh, if you can something mention like this that for example if the government was to remove this exemption what would be the impact on the economy what would happen to exports what would happen to production what would happen to employment if probably the authors can show that the effect would be minimal then probably yes uh, there would be a case for removing these exemptions or probably if you can show that uh, uh, this is distorting the level playing field that uh, one sector is taxed at the rate of 17% and the other is taxed at the rate of 5 or 0 so uh, this is sort of a rent seeking or whatever and if uh, this exemption was available to the other sector as well then that other sector may also uh, perform well so if this kind of an analysis would be helpful to the policy makers perhaps over to you then the same you would you like to respond or anyone from the authors uh thank you uh, dr rajesh and thank you uh, dr iftikhar uh, for such a nice comments um i would start with the uh, with dr iftikhar's comment i think uh, all of comments are really uh, wonderful comments and uh, i uh, completely agree with dr iftikhar Uh, regarding first comment like the literature review 
since you know work with the input output table and working with the huge data set and then connecting it with the uh, you know different connecting different data sets it required a lot amount of time to you know spend to uh, to, to perform this analysis so uh, uh, I had this in this thing in my mind, like uh, text part citation. So I'll add that uh, citation in, in the paper. So you know, a number of paper are there on developing country and South, on South Asian economies, and, and particularly in the context of Pakistan, we have a number of paper that we have to write, uh, we have to cite, and the pied work as well. Secondly, you suggested that why that yes. Mm, uh, we have mentioned, uh, you know, uh, little stuff in the introduction part, so we will emphasize on that, like uh, uh, by, you know, distinguishing the indirect and direct taxes and then why that. And policy and pr third comment regarding the policy and practice. Um, uh, I mean, the policy implications, it, it, of course, um, it, it uh, the first part is, like you know the extent, you know the size, then you talk about the policy implications. Perhaps in this paper, we won't discuss the incidents and the you know, extensive policy implication. We might be coming with another paper uh, in which we will discuss uh, in details uh, these, uh, you know, the incidents part and, uh, and the policy implications. But we will touch upon these um, points in our paper. So, uh, uh, graphical representation, uh, presentations, and uh, the list of the exemptions. Uh, yes, uh, we will add some uh, information in, our, in, in the final version. Uh, I hope I uh, touch upon all comments by the uh, Dr. Iftikhar. Uh, Dr. Dries, you made two comments. The first one, again, the policy implication and the list of exemptions and the cost benefit analysis of these exemptions. Uh, uh, yes, it requires, uh, you know, this ex tax expenditures. Uh, as you said, uh, can we calculate directly uh, the exemption and wherever you apply the whole tax rate? Um, we can do that um, even in the given the input supply and use table. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, what you suggested, it is sort of the simulation. When you don't have the exemption, when you have the exemptions, I think it's doable. Um, uh, I'm, I, I mean, it requires, uh, again, an other study to perform like where you uh, list down the exemptions and then do some micro simulations or some kind of uh, you know uh, analysis in which you look at when you don't have the exemption when you have the exemption and sometimes you see very wonderful uh, uh, observations like uh, you are giving exemption to one sectors but uh, you see more uh, uh, compliance gap also in that sectors so we actually first have to identify the distribution. Where is the gap? First, a policy gap. Where is the gap which is caused by the exemptions? And where is uh, the gap caused by the uh, compliance? When you have exemptions, then again, why there is a lot of uh, compliance gap? We have to have also a look at that. So uh, this paper uh, will touch upon this policy implication a bit. Um, but I take your suggestion. I will uh, uh, try to, uh, I mean, extend this paper. If we unable to extend this paper, we will be writing another paper. Okay, thank you. G. Uh, I will come to this point for a general debate uh, regarding having a series of papers. Uh, yes, and uh, that research, Dr. Nayab is also present here. So, we would like her views on this as well. Um, any questions from the floor? The floor sabhi questions hain toh please. On the third time hai and mujhe abhi jo hai ek aur webinar mein bhi participate karna ek baje. Main mo khale sab ko bhi shayad participate karna. 
अच्छा तो जिन अभी ये जो बात हुई कि एक सीरीज ऑफ पेपर होंगे और वो पॉलिसी इम्प्लीकेशन वगैरह उसमें होंगे कोई आप लोगों के व्यूज हैं जी मतलब मुझे फिर ये लगता है कि ये पेपर थोड़ा मैकेनिकल और असल कहानी उसमें होगी तो ऑफ कोर्स ये ऑथर्स के लिए तो बेहतर है नंबर ऑफ पेपर्स इंक्रीज हो जाते हैं लेकिन फिर वो तारीफ दूसरे वाले पेपर की होगी इस पेपर को लोग कहेंगे कि ये मैकेनिकल पेपर है इसमें तो पॉलिसी मेकर के लिए कुछ नहीं है so, uh, so, sir, आपकी आवाज मंसूर ने ऑफ तो वो है कि वो इम्प्लीकेशंस दूसरे में आएंगे तो फिर मेरा ख्याल है कि वो तारीफ फिर दूसरे वाले पेपर की होगी तो कहेंगे कि ये वाला पेपर मैकेनिकल है और मैं जनरल सिर्फ इस पेपर पे नहीं कह रहा हूँ तो इन जनरल अगर हाउस केस पे कोई व्यूज हैं तो पब्लिकेशन so as soon as we receive them the revised versions we would like to publish them as soon as possible perhaps in this month okay thank you all for joining let's close allah hafiz thank you allah hafiz